Hello and good morning from Rockland. I'm your host, Thomas Stockton. Coming up on this week's programme, COVID-19 update, City Council debate the future of Highway 174, Alfred Plantagenet reduce the number of councillors, we speak to the city about the YMCA and School Bus Safety Week. We start today's show with a long-awaited change as for the first time the city of Clarence Rockland acknowledged the unceded indigenous lands upon which the city is situated at the start of this week's council meeting. Bonsoir tout le monde, good evening everyone. Clarence Rockland is situated on a territory traditional and ancestral non ceded des nations Anishinaabe et Haudenosaunee. The city of Clarence Rockland is reconnaissant with gratitude to these nations autochtones. Clarence Rockland is situated on unceded traditional ancestral land of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations. The city of Clarence Rockland gratefully acknowledges these indigenous nations. Ouverture de la réunion à 6h33. It was a packed council meeting this week, with the city unveiling its new website, discussions over the Saint Pascal daycare, and the announcement that the surveillance cameras, which were part of the 2021 budget, will be soon installed in the city, including at the local skate park. The main topic of conversation, however, revolved around Highway 174. For decades now, the future of the highway has been much discussed, with traffic issues causing daily headaches for commuters. With empty promises having never been fulfilled by countless politicians, Clarence Rockland Mayor Mr Mario Zant put forward a proposal for a committee dedicated to negotiations over the future of the highway, made up of full-time members of the city's administrative staff. Having heard previous proposals from the city of Ottawa who own a large portion of the highway, Mayor Zant said he was worried about the potential implications if the city of Clarence Rockland didn't act soon. And so what my goal was is to establish this communication with the city of Ottawa and to essentially tell them that their idea is going to strangle us out. The only thing we have here on the west, we have Ottawa, we have a river, and then we have Quebec. But having all these conversations made us realize that we didn't really have an actual plan. The counties, uh, this is a county road, and um, their plan may be different than, than ours. Thank you, Mrs. Collier. Just to terminate uh, là-dessus, uh, I had a, uh, a meeting today uh, with um, the Ministry of Transportation regarding their plan for Eastern Ontario uh, roads, economic development, public transit, and uh, and the like. And um, they're very uh, their goal right now is very interested in in growing those types of uh, roads and providing additional transportation. I got uh, a chance to be able to speak. On, uh, on the fact that we did have a transit, but the transit was actually stuck in the same traffic going into Ottawa. So we needed a lot more to be done with our road. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, that fell on, on, on good ears. Um, I do have more meetings coming up with them as well. So this would be a really great first step to be able to anchor down our platform to be able to move this forward. The only, we can have a committee. There's no problem there, we, we can do that you'll end up with the same conclusion that most people are running into right now is that the only viable path, the only viable solution is an upload of that road to the provincial level. That is the only way that this will ever get done. Why? Uh, and Madame Collier can back me up on this because she was there. I had two meetings right with Jim Watson, Mayor Watson from Ottawa, and Stephen Blair was there as a counselor to the area of Orleans back then, now a local MPP in Orleans for uh, the province. And uh, they both looked at uh, myself, uh, Helen and Mr. Desjardins, our mayor, and bluntly told us that 174 is no, in, in no way, no shape in any of their plans at the city of Ottawa until at least 2035. And the plan, if, as you suggested, Mr. Mayor, and it was, we, we, we saw back in 2014 or 2015, is basically a, uh, a promenade or a, uh, um, slow, a slow uh, drive along, the, uh, along a, a river, not a highway. So, um, and the fact that the county has actually uh, gave you permission to create this, this uh, committee is quite telling. 
as well of their level of interest in actually making this happen. Because uh, if you look at their budgets, if I, they don't even have a dollar yet for uh, put aside for future expansion of the highway. And so, because why? Because it only serves Clarence Rockland. And um, so other mayors have other priorities and that's fine. Um, so it's, it's very difficult. And we've been, we've been talking about the expansion of the highway for 40 years. So it's, uh, we had the money, but if you want to know where it went, go and drive the 416 in Ottawa leading to the 401. That's the money that was set for us. But we, we, we lost it. Why? Because Ottawa is much bigger, a much bigger fish in the pond. And, and that's just the way politics works. And why the expansion happened on the west side of Ottawa? It's all provincial highway. That's, that's the key to us getting this project done. It will never get done with the city of Ottawa and the counties and us as a partner because one, they won't agree to what we want. And if you talk to Jim Watson one-on-one, -on -one, he will tell you, he does not want that highway. He wants it uploaded. It's, well, actually, it's actually part of Mr. Blaise's platform to get reelected. And it's part of Madame Collard, I think, uh, as well, her platform. And it, it's just, I, I'm not trying to be negative, Mr. Mayor. It's just, we've been ru running around for 40 years trying to, trying to achieve this. The right. only viable path is an upload. We need to get so, to what. Thank you, Mr. Lenon. But the problem that we've also had is that for 40 years, that highway has been used as election campaigns and election slogans, and nothing's ever been done. But what we can do while their campaigning is happening, and we always say this, we, every, we all get promised this every single time. And every time we sit back and we wait, and then they go, ah, uh, you know what, there's no money. There's one thing too. Um, first of all, two things. This highway is the key to economic development, not just for Clarence Rockland, but anything that goes here, then it starts growing in Wendover and Alpha Plantagenet. I mean, it's going to keep going that way, just as we're getting bigger. Once we have that link, it's going to get there. But I'm not going to sit back, and I don't think this council should sit back and wait for an election campaign that's only going to do this. And if they don't win, but if that doesn't happen, then we sit back for another four years and just keep waiting and waiting. And this entire time, our entire economic development plan goes to waste because we just can't get it. We're not Embraer or Russell. We don't have the 417. This is the, our only way in. And so if we're going to try to grow this community and actually grow eastward to other municipalities, I think we owe it to at least ourselves to try something. But I'm not going to sit back and wait on election promises that never seem to happen. I understand how hard this is going to be. If, if Mr. Jean-Marc Nadon was an MPP for many, many years, and if he couldn't done, I understand the impact of what it is. But I think we at least owe it to ourselves to put forth a roadmap because the situation's changed in the last 40 years. We can't go up to somebody in Toronto and tell and complain that we have 30,000 cars on a highway when they've got the 401. They really don't think that that's a lot of cars and they don't care. But if we actually pitch it on an economic development stand and we actually prepare something, then I don't think that, I think that's a really good price to pay for now. But I, I, I yeah, I'm not saying that. that on. Yeah, I'm not saying we sit back. I'm What I'm saying is we need to change the strategy for an upload versus a try uh, three people funding the funding the program. The, the second, and I understand that, the second the province uploads this road, they're going to have 443 other municipalities begging to upload roads. And I think that that is a slippery slope that even a government would not want to take. And that's one thing that I'm worried about. This is why we want to do this is because I'm tired of waiting on promises for election campaigns and here's 50 million and oh, that disappears and oh yeah, we're gonna do it and then that disappears. Now let's take a glance at the COVID-19 situation in our region. At the time of recording, five out of the 62 active cases in Prescott Russell were in Clarence Rockland. The figures in Prescott Russell have been primarily driven up by the outbreak that we reported last week at the Saint-Francois long-term care home in Castleman. But despite the outbreak, there is a clear downward trajectory of transmission, with the seven-day rolling average now down to 27.6. The outbreak in Castleman was slightly worse than initially thought, as unfortunately, out of the 54 residents who tested positive, two have died. 
this is a residence where we had the, the majority of the individuals were fully vaccinated um, in, in, in uh, the residence. Um, uh, unfortunately, 54 out of the 72 were positive. Um, most were asymptomatic. However, um, uh, six uh, are in hospital right now and we had two deaths. Um, uh, six were not vaccinated among those that are positive. We also had seven out of the 30 staff positive. Uh, five of, of those were vaccinated, two were not in, in that situation. Um, and again, I said, sorry, there are eight that are uh, hospitalized uh, and unfortunately we had two deaths. Now, um, we, uh, the majority of those individuals who are, who are uh, at, the, at the home are either very mildly symptomatic or have no symptoms at all, which is good news. Uh, we are supporting the home uh, through the LIN and, and, and through our, um, our nurses walk, walking in and looking at kind of support to have the infection control and so on. Uh, we have gone on site to support them in terms of that. In, in terms of that. But what I just wanted to say is that this is an example of why we, uh, we're, we're now uh, vaccinating re retirement homes as well. Uh, we're seeing that, and for the most part, these individuals were 75, 80 years old or, or older. Um, and uh, they were, you know, because of the age group, the, we know that the vaccines in the first place don't work as effectively as they would in a younger individual. And we do know the vaccine wanes. And we vaccinated these individuals around February. So now is the time that we're starting to see it waning. So we have now, uh, that's why we've already vaccinated our long-term care uh, homes, a third dose. And we are, uh, we are now um, uh, progressing to vaccinate. We, I think we're doing 10 retirement homes this week. We will be uh, vaccinating this home next week. Uh, we want to be out, want it to be out of outbreak, but uh, we are uh, determined now to go and vaccinate all of our all of our retirement homes and all of our what we call you know long term uh, long term care uh, not long term congregate senior settings. That's very important for us. One of the region's largest long-term care centres, the residence Prescott Russell, which is operated by the United Counties, announced this week that all visitors must be double vaccinated. This includes, but is not limited to, caregivers, volunteers and students. The mandate stems from a memo which was received on the 1st of October by the Ministry of Long-Term Care. Stop in the name of love isn't just a major hit song from the 1960s, no, it's also a campaign to keep our children safe. This week, the Student Transportation of Eastern Ontario, STEO, marked School Bus Safety Week across the region, encouraging the public to educate themselves on keeping children safe as they travel to and from school. With over 800,000 students travelling to more than 18,000 schools in Ontario every single day, STEO themselves have 700 vehicles which take a 30,000 student body to school and back every single day in eastern Ontario alone. The campaign reminds people to stop for school buses when the lights are flashing red, no matter which direction you're coming from. As well as a reminder just to adhere to general traffic laws, as well as etiquette, including no rushing, paying attention to what's going on, and of course, no checking your phone in your car. And speaking of schools, an element of the cultural and recreational complex, which is attached to Lescal Secondary School here in Clarence Rockland, are opening their doors for the first time since the pandemic hit in March 2020. Yes, that's right, the local YMCA will once again be offering fitness classes and gym facilities to the population of the region starting on the 1st of November. And we popped over the road to discover what classes will be available, what the timeline's looking like for more things opening, and why it took so long for them to get their doors open to the public once again. So specifically towards vaccine mandates, we are uh, mandated by the provincial government as a fitness facility, as a recreational facility, to require that anyone who wishes to use our facility, be it a member or a visiting guest, provide us with valid proof of vaccination. Um, so we will continue to abide by that policy as long as the government requires us to do so. Uh, in uh, the second week of September, around the 16th of September, the Y implemented its own vaccination policy for its staff. 
and uh, we currently have 100 percent compliance with our staff in terms of vac our vaccination policy so we will continue with that as far as other uh, health and safety measures uh, covid wise we implemented um, the highest level of COVID safety measures at the very beginning of the pandemic based on all the regulations coming from um, both the health units that we're involved with, Ottawa Public Health and the Eastern Ontario Health Unit and the government. And we've been implementing those from the beginning. We had uh, some camp time, we had some opening and closing, we had the uh, maintaining the facilities for the school to, uh, in, uh, to encounter. So we've been maintaining those uh, procedures all along. and. Um, things that uh, uh, COVID screening, our cleaning procedures and whatnot will continue to stay at those uh, high levels, even if we get some leniency from the government. We just want to keep the, uh, the safety of our uh, patrons and staff at the, uh, at the top level. So. And uh, come November 1st, there's going to be a limited number of classes, obviously, as you first kind of ease your way into what it's going to look like. What kind of classes are going to be available and what is the YMCA's plan for increasing those classes for the population? Right. So um, we're very, we're so excited to have people come back and I'm, and, and monitoring the level of excitement in the community. We're really hopeful that it's going to be a, a wonderful return. However, we are um, proceeding cautiously and starting with a pared down uh, fitness class schedule. And we've chosen the fitness classes on that schedule based on two things. And the first being the classes that were the best attended and most popular prior to having to shut down for the pandemic. So we've chosen some classes based on that. And the other uh, factor in making the choices of the classes on the schedule are the classes that we've had some success with in our opening at our Taggart location. So we've chosen some classes based that way. Um, some of the most uh, popular favorites such as yoga and Zumba and strength conditioning and one of the favorites in this particular location are, are young at heart classes. So people will see those uh, on the sampling when we open November 1st. But as I said, we are really uh, positive thinking and excited that uh, we think the folks in Rockland are going to turn out in, in droves. And should that be and demand uh, dictates, then we will look at adding classes to the schedule as demand dictates. And we will do that when we, we see what the numbers look like. And uh, the fact that this opening is fantastic already. But gyms throughout the country have opened and closed during the pandemic. But the YMCA here itself has remain closed the entire time. And you mentioned Taggart there, the fact that in downtown Ottawa, they have been open since about the start of September, I believe you're saying. So why has the YMCA remained completely closed off to the public for the entirety of the pandemic thus far when other gym facilities such as other brands, not to name any until they sponsor us, uh, but uh, and why, why have they been able to open and close again, but this place has remained closed the whole time? So at the time, uh, as I say, we were in the middle of uh, negotiating the new agreement. Um, and as of right now, the city pays the um, deficits uh, towards the building. So any deficit that would otherwise uh, will uh, suffer uh, throughout those few months, the city will cover that deficit. Um, reopening gym is not an easy task right now with all the COVID restrictions. How many people will come back? Uh, it's a big question mark. And the reality of gyms and uh, recreational complex like this one is um, the user fees and the revenues are come from the users. So if there's no users, there's a big deficit. So it was a decisions between the, the YMC and us to see when would be the appropriate time to open back up. And we thought of letting a bit the school, the, all the school open up and see how COVID was doing after the school openings and put a date uh, around November 1st, as we thought it would be the, 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 the best for everyone to open at that time to make sure that the people would come back uh, and not create a, a big, big deficit for the municipality um, by opening and having an empty building. And what Tracy mentioned earlier that uh, there was part of the why they did have to open and close again with the school be having that affiliation there. Would that not have been able to use to sort of like create again a space for people to come in or was, because they, they had staff here already, the building was opening due to the schools. Could that not have been utilized in a very similar way? Would it have created that much of a deficit? The school, the, the, the staff that needed to be in to run or to be, be able to open for the school was really, really minimal. Uh, we, the, the Y had only one staff in place, uh, the janitor who had a lot of other tasks to do just to maintain the building and just having the school going in and out from the other side. So mm -hmm. yes, if we would have opened up and having 
to hire a lot more staff, um, it would have created a, a definitely a, a bigger deficit. So great news there about the YMCA opening their doors. As you heard, there's going to be a bunch of classes going on as soon as it opens on the 1st of November. And as the weeks go on, I think the pool is set to be open around mid-November as well. And classes will only continue to expand from there. Unlike a lot of other gyms during this pandemic, it's not going to be booking time slots either. Uh, the, the way in which that's going to work at the start is you just come in and you're able to use those facilities. But if it gets busier, the YMCA do have a plan to implement sort of a color-coded scheme to ensure for everyone to know how busy the gym is looking at that time. But all round great news for the, uh, for the Clarence Rockland region as we will try and work off some of that pandemic weight. I know I am. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, the municipal council in the township of Alfred Plantagenet discussed the possibility of reducing the number of councillors at the next election. Following a unanimous decision as of, the 20, as of the 2023 election, Alfred Plantagenet will have four council members dropping down from their current six. In a decision that Mayor Stéphane Sarrazin said will hopefully encourage more people to put their names forward. The remaining four council seats are likely to receive a slight pay increase as well. And earlier this week, I spoke to Mayor Sarrazin here in our studios about some of the risks in reducing the number of representatives. I think uh, talking about the administration side, I mean, we're better equipped than we were three years ago. You know, we, we created new, um, new jobs. We have an engineer, we have an economic development uh, agent. So I think we're, we're ready for it. And I think the fact that we only have two ward, uh, I think people will have a chance to uh, be uh, well president, like, you know, like th their counselor, there'll be two counselor in each ward. I think it's a good representation, if you ask me. So you think it's a better representation than having three girls, obviously. We know there's been murmurs, say, in the city of Clarence Rockland, the municipality here, of potentially reducing at some point. Well, nothing concrete, obviously, just murmurs itself. But one of the oppositions would always be that residents want a face to their representation, a face in, in their area where they live. So are you not worried that potentially it could split it up in that sense and that some residents would feel hard done by that they don't have someone from their area or someone who, who is supposed to represent exactly where they live to come and bring their own complaints to? I'm not too worried about it personally, but I think you know it's an opportunity for people to say, hey, we need representation in our village, let's step up and let's get interested and you know we'll go in election and give us the chance to have people uh, to have good candidates that are really passionate about you know what's going on in their village or in their uh, in their ward so i think at the end of the day you know having like it's not uh, we can't compare to rockland we have like population of 10,000 you know in alfred Plantagenet. so if when you think about it you know you have uh, four or five uh, council members to represent 10,000 people. I think that's plenty, you know. You have a chance to, uh, each ward has a chance to, uh, like the, the constituents has a chance to reach out to two councillors plus the mayor, because mm. the mayor does work on both sides. So I think it's, it's fair, yeah. And you mentioned there the population of 10,000 people. And we talk about engagement, especially as you're trying to encourage potentially more people to, to, to step up and take a role. Uh, in running a municipality. Uh, the public consultation that was put in place to ensure that you had the, uh, the, the say of the people to be able to move forward for this, it was, it was overwhelmingly in favour of this, but it was only 200, approximately about 200 people who came out and actually responded to this. Do you feel like that's a fair representation of your ele electorate? Probably not, you know, like we have 10,000 uh, people. When we talk about 10,000 people, I don't remember exactly how many electors we've got, you mm. know, like uh, we have kids, we have, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, of course, you know, 200 is a really small percentage. But uh, I guess, you know, like probably people that did care about the, that issue uh, went and filled the, um, the, the survey. Uh, of course, you know, 200 out of 10,000, mm. it's not a, a great representation, but 72 or I was around 70% that voted in favor of uh, reducing the council. Uh, so I think we're, it's fair, you know, we give them a chance to, uh, to tell them what they thought about it and uh, mm. we did it. You know? 
And being the mayor of the township of Alfred Plantagenet, as well as the warden for the United Counties of Prescott Russell, this here looking at like 200 people coming out and filling out this public consultation. Do you see that as an issue for municipalities in general, that there is a lack of maybe public engagement with what happens in terms of the running of a municipality? Would you call it a problem? And if so, how, how would you think we can go forward with, I want to say rectifying, but maybe just simply increasing engagement with, with, pub, with the public? It's hard. I mean, we've been, uh, you know, trying to uh, like outreach to through social media, through our website. We even have like Telmatic, which is a system that we we go ahead and send some phone calls saying, hey, we'll have a public consultation. So at the end of the day, we tried hard to get more than 200 people to uh, participate to the survey. But, uh, you know, there is all kinds of reason. I mean, people are busy. Uh, they didn't have time to, to do the survey. But um, Often, you know, like uh, afterwards, uh, a decision is taken based on the survey and then people come to us and say, hey, we didn't have a say, you know, like we, uh, but hey, yeah, that's, that's how it works. You know, people are not always uh, um, following the meetings. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot better than it used to be because when we had, the, before we had virtual meetings, we had like probably five, six person, uh, five, six taxpayers in a meeting. Now we have like thousands of watchers. So I feel we, we did better as a, a council, you know. We try to inform our people, but at the end of the day, there's so much we can do. If they don't, if they're not interested, then, you know, we can force them. And uh, just finally, in a nutshell, what benefits do you really feel like this is going to bring to the township of Alfred Plantagenet, this decision to reduce councillors? We're hoping that we're going to, and I, I'm thinking, and that's something I can talk for myself, I'm hoping at next budget meeting because this is something that will go on uh, after the election of 2023. Uh, so we'll be uh, electing like four councillors and one mayor in 2023. So I'm hoping that after that we can decide to raise uh, the salary of a councillor to make sure that some people would be interested, you know, and we're really hoping to have people that are passionate about what's going on in our municipality to come forward and say, hey, I'm interested. And, you know, when they get that uh, that big 250 page uh, uh, binder PDF file before the uh, uh, before the uh, council meeting that they have read it and they, they really, uh, you know, if they had question, they did ask the question and they're really ready to debate for the sake of our, our constituents. And there we have, that was Mayor Sarazen talking about reducing representation, but hopefully increasing the quality of it. That's it for your news roundup here this week. As ever, if there's a story within the community, not just Clarence Rockland, but Prescott Russell at wide, that you think more light needs to be shined on, then don't hesitate, reach out to us. You can call me at the station, just hit extension number four, or you can email me at nouvelle with an S at the end at tvc22.ca. And for now, it's good morning from me, it's good morning from the team, and I'll see you next weekend. Goodbye.